we wanted to talk to you about the typology of wealth. And this is something that the Good Ancestor Movement have been working on. So I wanted to introduce Jake Heyman. So Jake is someone who's worked in this sector for over two decades. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur, started lots of different charities and social enterprises. He's at the Good Ancestor Movement at the moment, and he's going to talk to you a bit about the typology of wealth. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, over the last six months or so, uh, we've been working alongside wealth holders and advisors and civil society actors um, to try and look into the peripheral vi vision of what we're talking about when we're talking about progressive wealth, not just an intention to be more progressive than we currently are, although this is a journey for everyone who's engaging on it, but also an absolute. What does it mean when you have a set of values to live those values through your wealth? Um, and if we can write that down and codify it um, in a way that we're going to no doubt keep iterating, not least because anyone who will notice on the four pin boards outside where this is up, there are multiple grammar errors, and I was responsible for proofreading. So <laughs> we will be iterating on multiple fronts. Um, um, and, um, but also to think about what's possible and even what can be expected of wealth holders who carry values with them in how they um, manage and define and act with regard to their wealth. So the spectrum shows a progressive wealth holder on the um, right-hand side who thinks about estate and wealth planning, not just in preservation and accumulation, no, and not in what is enough for me, but what is the inequality quotient of a society that I'm willing to live in? What is, does that mean for me as a starting point in my wealth planning journey? And how does that affect how much I choose to retain and how much I look to redistribute? Um, a progressive wealth holder is someone who is no longer interested in asset price speculation. Uh, the idea of a fund that moves them from speculating on the price of Exxon to speculating on the price of Tesla while having no connection to the real economy is not an appealing thing to them. And the idea of a fund that allows them to make money out of COVID and climate change when they're in a position of having more money than they want in the first place and more money than they think is right is not something that necessarily appeals to them. We've heard a lot about tax, but a progressive wealth holder is someone who thinks about tax in terms of what would a fair system look like and tries to align their payments to that, not, what they're legal, not just limited to what they're legally obliged to do. And there's someone who follows the repair and reparations journey that Esther so amazingly spelled out for us all today. Um, and there's someone who thinks about their business ownership in terms of if I already have more than I need, then why do I need to retain control of this business? And what does the fact that this business is bringing me profit and power mean for those who, for whom that profit could be redistributed and that power could be shared? And so they're interested in mutualization cooperatives and deprioritizing themselves as the shareholder stakeholder. Um, and what we want to talk about today in the conversation about the trusted advisor is how this maps against the advisory industry. And through numerous conversations with advisors and wealth holders, we started to do exactly that. And I want to show you a slide that looks at it across two different axes. Um, and there's a third that I'm going to bring in as well. The first is around proficiency of advisor services. I think it's safe to say, unless anyone in the room is going to correct me, there is zero proficiency around services connected to reparations and repair on the terms in which Esther was discussing them. Um, and so even if a wealth holder comes through and even if an advisor wants to support, they don't know how to do it. Um, there is little pr proficiency around completely non-extractive approaches to investment that don't prioritize any profit on any investment ever again because you have more than you need in the first place. Um, and our more progressive um, wealth holders who are talking to their advisors about tax find incapabilities to understand that tax um, encompasses state benefits as well as the contributions towards it. Um, and so the proficiency of advisory sector is there to be improved so that they can serve these progressive wealth holders who are interested in these themes. But it's not just about proficiency of services, it's also about culture. Because if you have an advisory sector that is culturally dissuasive towards paying more tax, which I think 
Kirsty's pre uh, presentation was pretty unequivocal about, then that affects wealth holder behavior and it affects what they're going to ask for and it affects how they feel in those meetings with that trusted guide who they're relying upon to get through this minefield that's ahead of them. And so the culture of advisors is just as important as proficiency of services. Um, and culturally, there is great alignment with the idea of maximize, recruit, um, preserve and accumulate and very little alignment with the ideas of redistribution, reparation, and regeneration. Um, and so there is room for movement, both on the proficiency side and on the, um, uh, on the uh, cultural side. And then there's a third part as well, because what we've seen is a proliferation of mainstream advisory firms, particularly I'll take the investment space, who are offering ethical investment product. And this is really interesting because um, in many ways this is a great victory for those who want to see a much more ethical, holistic approach to investment. Um, but if you put yourself in the position of the progressive wealth holder, I like the analogy of asking the vegetarian to go into a steakhouse and celebrate the fact that they'll now sell you a mushroom burger. You are still propping up the steakhouse even if what you're buying from them is in line with your values. And for the most progressive wealth holders, they don't want to do business in a steakhouse. They don't want to go to an advisory firm where the advisor is now able to understand their needs as a tax proud client, um, but you know that that advisor is going to the next meeting to take someone into a tax minimization and an extractive mindset. And they don't want to do business with an investment advisor who is um, <laughs> generating profits through uh, more progressive investments that are then going into big companies that are uh, owned by organizations that are doing extractive investment and investing against them. And so it's not just a matter of what fund and what product and what service, and it's not just a matter of what culture there is, it's also a matter of values alignment between the wealth holder um, and, uh, and the client. Um, and it's why I'm so excited um, to set up the next um, couple of panels um, because we have some amazing wealth holders coming up who are going to be sharing their stories. And I think that um, the first thing to say is that this um, presentation and this is a map about a journey. And our invitation to wealth holders is to take a step anywhere <laughs> um, onto this and to realize themselves on it so that they can think about progressing through it. The reality is that if you try and be progressive on everything always, you end up having to make compromises because it's impossible to do everything on tax and everything on investments and everything on transfer of business ownership and everything on reparation and everything on wealth planning. Um, it's impossible to do it all and so we do have to make choices and we don't expect wealth holders to shift from zero knowledge about this to saying that they have to be progressive on everything always tomorrow. But once we've laid out the board and the journey, people can start to chart their way across it and realize that extractive investing that is slightly le more ethical than the most <laughs> um, unethical extractive investing is not progressive. Uh, just because it's a bit better than the most extractive doesn't mean that it's aligned with values. Um, and the second reason that I'm excited about the panels is because we're going to have some advisors speaking and they are people who think deeply about this and carefully about this and I know they all care about it. Um, and it's a real honor for me today to be able to announce that in fact we're launching today a movement of people from within the advisory industry who are dedicated to thinking about how it can transform along the lines of more progressive values and how they can better serve um, progressive clients. And this is something that has been uh, brought together through a series of kind of anonymized, anti-competitive, interdisciplinary meetings over the last six months with some brilliant people who are prepared to put their organization second and the sector and the mission that we're all a part of first and think about how the sector can transform. Um, and I just wanted to pass over to three brilliant people from different disciplines who've been a part of those meetings um, to just share for uh, a sentence or two why they've become involved or attended meetings for the progressive advisor movement and signal them as people that anyone who wants to be involved can come and join afterwards. So maybe we could start with you, Katia, if that's okay. It will, it will kick in. Thank you 
you very much, Jay. Um, my name is Katya Wagner, and I'm a private wealth lawyer, like Steph, at Floodgate. And I'm joining Progressive Advisor Movement because I want to be a better advisor, a better trusted advisor, the term we've heard so much today about. Our clients, regardless of where they are on the wealth spectrum that Jake's been telling us about, deserve to be informed so they can make up their mind. And it's our collective job to educate them. It's not something happening in the industry currently. So, and based on, based on my experience and based on everything we've heard today, so I'm very excited to see how Progressive Advisor Movement can change that and look forward to playing my part within legal industry and the wealth building industry in particular. If anyone wants to come and chat to me about the experience of using legal services in this area, please come and find me. Uh, so. Thank you. Today's been extremely informative. I very much look forward to the Wealth Holders panels in particular. Thanks, Katia. Tim? Hello, I'm Tim Fuller. I'm a wealth planning advisor from, I work for a company called Saunderson House. Um, I suppose I, I come at this in sort of, I've spent a few years being a bit challenged personally by some of the things that we as wealth planners do that run up against my own values. And then just like looking around at our industry and being frustrated by the kind of identikit solutions that are laid onto what we think clients want, but without having good enough conversations with clients about what they really want, what really matters to them. Um, I've been frustrated by hearing clients saying, but this is all really complex. It's not what I, I wanted. Why have we ended up here? And it's because there's such a formulaic approach to we think these are the solutions because perhaps as, in, as an industry, we keep telling ourselves these are solutions that actually serve us a bit better rather than the client. Um, and I think being part of an organization like this, a process like this, it will enable advisors to have much better conversations with their clients to really understand what they want. Um, and I think just, I, I'm very, very enthusiastic. Actually, if you get out and talk to the people in our industry and understand what they really think about this subject, um, we'd actually be very surprised with how progressive they perhaps are, but keeping it a bit under the under wraps. Um, with, you know, for fear of the the upper echelons that make decisions in our industry. Um, so if we can spread the word, we can probably change things quite a lot from inside more quickly than than we think. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Nesri Tato. I'm a wealth manager at Tribe Impact Capital. Um, so we were the first, the UK's first impact wealth manager. And you know, I guess for me, um, similarly to some advisors here, my, my journey began more, I guess, on the, on the bad side, the traditional side of investing and predominantly really helping clients to protect and grow their wealth. And I think, you know, the, the industry really lacked that ability to just listen to our clients. I think a lot has been said about um, being a trusted advisor. What does that mean? Giving a voice to our clients. We should be, in my view, it's, it's a partnership. And what does partnership look like? Partnership means me, first of all, accepting that this is a journey. I won't have the answer to everything, but ultimately I really want to understand what you care about and how we can translate that. And so what really excites me about this movement is that to Steph's point, it's about being visionary and really wanting to change wealth management for good and seeing how we can do that together. Um, it's, it's not radical, it's reformative, it's, um, and it's bringing our clients on that journey. So, you know, happy to kind of speak to, to anyone that's also kind of interested in that as well. But yeah, hope we continue the conversations. Thank you. Thank you, team. And without further ado, we'll, work, we'll welcome up David Curran and her panel. Thank you.